All right, I'm at PAX East with my co-host in arms, Jeff Moonen. How's it going, everybody? And we're here with Sophie from Fishing Cactus. Hi, Sophie. Hi, I'm Sophie from Fishing Cactus. So we're here to talk about Outshined, a typing adventure game, like action game. Talk a little bit about what specifically Outshined is. So Outshine is mostly an arcade game. So the thing is that we released before uh, two other typing games that were Epistory and Undertale, and we had that arcade mode in uh, in those games. And the community from from Epistory and Undertale really liked it and asked us to do like a game based on that that is more fast paced, less an adventure, not RPG, real pure arcade game. So we decided to go for Outshine. Amazing. Talk a little bit about the aesthetic of Outshine and like how you guys came to this kind of cyberpunk look for it. We wanted to convey the old arcade feeling. And also we wanted to have something that's purely different from what we've done before because the other game was more, were more like fantasy games. And we didn't want to have that. We wanted to have something that's sci-fi that works well with the fast-paced gameplay. Now, this game could be difficult for people who are not great at typing. Talk a little bit about the kind of customizations you have that allow to adjust the difficulty and experience of this game. You can create your own experience with the game by using what we call modifiers. So modifiers is thing that you will tweak to do exactly what we want for the game. So when you start the game, you have to move your character from right to left to avoid like traps. But uh, with modifiers, you can make create an auto avoidance so you don't have to move it yourself. You can just like make it more difficult. Uh, you can change all the typo. If you don't like like the, the, the font that it's used in the game, you can change it. You can do a lot of things just to make sure that it's not a punishment to play a, to play a <laughs> typing game. Well, certainly and, for an arcade-style yeah. game, you want that to be more of a joy and more of a fun exactly, thing. Exactly, exactly. We want people to say, OK, that was good. I will try something else now. And we want people who are just challenger to want to play again and play something else. We have a solid leaderboard so people can see what their friends uh, play with which modifiers and they can like play exactly the same version that their friends play and try to challenge them. So I didn't play the demo because I'm a terrible typist, but Jeff did. Jeff, do you have any specific questions to the gameplay and the experience? A couple of things. I mean, certainly, because I do have some experience with typing games, but I'm not deep in the community. Is it the sort of thing where when these levels come up, is it always the same words every time so that you can learn it in a pattern like that? Or is it pulled from sort of a, a dictionary of words to a certain size. Yeah, it comes from a dictionary. The, those are completely random, coming from the dictionary. And each kind of enemies have their own dictionary. So it's one dictionary by enemies. The difference is just that the length of the word. And so every time it's just a new game, so you can't learn it by heart. It's not possible. Also, something that I was noticing is I am a very rusty touch typist. And so this is actually kind of a very interesting game in terms of because of how fast paced it is, getting your confidence back as a typist has, whether uh, your previous games as well, as well as this one, has there been any educational interest in applying this gameplay? Yeah, the funny thing is, as you said, it can help like people who, um, who haven't typed for a long time. And the funny thing is here we, we took some QWERTY keyboards, so American keyboard, but we are playing with Azerity keyboard. And uh, at another convention, we forgot the QWERTY keyboard and we were with Azerity. And people, they just, they were super afraid because they didn't trust themselves that much as they, they didn't want to, to play. And I say, just don't look at the keyboard, just trust your muscular memory. And so they trusted it and they play without watching the keyboard. They completely forgot that it was as already and they play like if it was a query. It was fantastic. I love that. We mentioned before we started recording that you actually have had some schools interested in this and some of your other games just based on how it helps teach folks to type. Is that a goal when making a game like this? Do you want it also to be used for educational purposes and teaching or is it just a the, bonus? Is it just a kind of a bonus? Yeah, yeah absolutely not. Yes, it's a bonus. The thing is, when we created our first typing game, it was our very first game. And we wanted to have something that is out of the box, something very different. And so when we created the story, we were just like, OK, so we want an adventure game. We know that we want some RPG elements, but we want something like our touch on it. And then we thought about typing games and we all play like the old typing of the dead and we really liked it. And so we decided to, to do something like around typing, but make it like a real mechanic and not just like a gimmick, like mechanic, like in typing of the dead. We want it to be more um, or something deeper. And yes, and so 
school thought it was an amazing idea to practice typing. So that we have already Nanotel and Epistory in some school, and I'm sure that they will be interested in uh, in Outshine. But it was not the purpose when we created those titles. My other question is, what other genres do you see yourselves going into now that you've done a bunch of different games? Like to me, like a visual novel seems like a, an obvious progression, right? Where you can type your responses and like maybe there's a library of responses or something. Have y'all thought about that kind of like how what other genres of game you could apply typing to? Oh, there's a lot of genre. I, I th there's other games uh, you should watch. Um, these guys, th there there are some guys, German guys, that are creating um, a typing game. It's called uh, Touch Type Tale. They were fan of Hippie Story, and so they wanted to have their own typing game. And this one is a strategy game. Oh wow! Cool. Yeah, but it's it's super cool. You should check it out. I would definitely say like that would get me to play a sports game. If there was a typing <laughs> sports game, that's oh no, that's horrifying. Yeah, <laughs> it would be interesting though. Like you can't shoot the ball until you type the right word or who something. Who are you gonna throw the ball to? You type the word of who you're throwing the ball to, and it moves on from there. Actually, now that I'm saying this out loud, I really like this. <laughs> so this is coming to Steam. Obviously, it's a PC game because it's keyboard related. Do you guys have a release date or a release window for this? I would like to release it for September. The game is ready already, but we want to do like a deep like optimization phase on it to make sure that it runs on all computer and then release in September. Now, does this just run on PC or is this a Mac uh, title as well? For the moment, it's just on PC. We're thinking about Mac and Linux version, but we'll see later after after the first release. That's really cool. And I guess a fun little random question. Given that you are planning on having this in several languages, several different keyboards, you mentioned that in particular we're playing this on a QWERTY American keyboard right now. Are there any particular languages or particular, you know, it's great in English. I know English. We have three letter words. We have four letter words. That's fine. Are there any particular languages that you run into a little bit of a hump on that, whether because of the keyboard layout or the, the amount of words, the characters that you need for that or anything like that. That's yeah, the, the thing is, uh, when we start, started to do typing games, the game designer of Nanotail, so the previous title, uh, not Ochai, and me, we started to learn Japanese and Korean to help us to understand how the language works. So we can't really like, uh, we are not fluent, we can't, we can't speak, but we understand like the symbols and how to use them. And so we can just like spot like if there are like issues with the translation or anything we can spot it like quickly and that helps a lot and also um, I think the worst was like the translation in Korean because they have their own keyboard so it's not an authority or a query keyboard it's the Korean keyboard and so we needed to know the keyboard by heart to test it ourselves and that's a, that's a lot of work <laughs> that's amazing that's certainly a way to build your own confidence in that in that alphabet well, thank you, Sophie, for taking the time to chat with us. We have a saying on the podcast, which is happy gaming. It's our sign off. I'd love for you to just say your name and then say happy gaming. OK, this is Sophie. And remember, happy gaming. All right. We're talking to Augie, the CEO of Chromatic Games. We're excited about their brand new game, Going Rogue, a roguelike version in the Dungeon Defenders world. Augie, thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having us. So tell us why a roguelike. After all these awesome tower defense games you've all done and done different things, why a roguelike now? Well, we wanted to do something new and fun and interesting. And our first few games sort of solved the problem of tower defense and action RPG. So our designers were like, huh, what could be fun? Well, you know what? Roguelikes are really fun right now. Let's give that a shot. So we adapted tower defense action RPG and created this game called Going Rogue. That's more like hero defense. And we've created this game called Dungeon Fairness Going Road. And it's on early access, Steam. Fantastic. Well, given that tower defense always kind of left me in the cold, I'm very excited about this. It gets down to the ground nitty gritty that I like. Now, was there a lot of debate or anything about, all right, how much do we let go of tower defense? How much do we keep from older Dungeon Defender titles to then put into this? Because, yeah, new genre gets in newer people, but where's the balance, I guess? Yeah, so, you know, balance is very important. So what we did is we, we upped the action. We tiled the action up to 11, and the, the tower aspects are more like hero abilities. So the towers last only about 20 seconds, and then on top of laying them down, they do other things like explode or cause damage when you lay them down. So more like abilities. So we're calling it hero defense. I love that term. So now, obviously, you've got your three classic main heroes that anyone who's played these games would be familiar with. 
Was there a lot of retooling to make them fit in this world, or did their abilities kind of just translate to this new genre? Um, there's a lot of retooling. There's a lot of retooling because we want to up-pace the action. In traditional Dungeon Offender games, a session can last two or three hours easily. Nice. Here, yeah. the action's 20 minutes. So you're in and out, you get your satisfaction, and then you can go back to work. So what we're showing here today for the first time, we haven't released this new hero called the Warden. So we're showing that today, and it's probably going to be launched very soon. And we'll have a tournament to correspond with her release. So, Ooh, awesome. Yeah. So obviously these games, more important than the heroes, you might even say, are the villains, the bad guys, the boss battles. They make the challenge happen. What was it like to defend the waves of enemies and the boss battles for this versus the previous games? Oh, yes. So you know what? We're giving people what they love, and they love boss fights. Mm -hmm. We don't know. We, it's more than bosses. We have boss arena fights. So nice. we create these special levels just for the bosses. And these boss fights, there's not like, oh, you shoot them, they're dead in 10 seconds, which a lot of people can do. No, you'll be grinding these bosses for minutes and like trying to avoid their fire and brimstone. So boss arena fights, a big, big new thing with this game. Well, between the boss arenas and kind of the hero towers, it definitely seems like there's a lot of good area control going on with this, which is kind of an extra level on top of your usual roguelike. Now, is that area control pervasive throughout the gameplay and then the boss arenas are distillation? So you're absolutely right. I mean, controlling your area is extremely important. I mean, that's why you have your towers, oh, your temporary towers. It's like, hey, I'm going to leave these towers here so it controls that area. I can fight off this ogre that's coming at me and then come back to it 20 seconds later. And another big thing that I help with area control is co-op, four-player co-op with this game. You know, you can have two of your friends over in this lane. I'm over here, and this guy is taking care of this ogre. Very important, and it's more fun with friends, right? <laughs> always, always. So, talking about the co-op of it, well, how does the scaling work? Do the bosses and the encounters yeah. get harder the more players you have? Yeah, the more players you have, it scales with difficulty with more players you have. And you have to stay alive, because if you die, the scaling still <laughs> there, so stay alive, being a roguelite. So, obviously this is a new genre you're jumping into. It does have a lot of the core gameplay mechanics that everyone's familiar with with your series. Just off the top of your head, if you could go into any other genre after this, is there a dream genre you'd love to take this world into? Um, yes. <laughs> I'm not allowed to talk about it. We have plans. We're going to be playing around with different things. How about that? You know, this year is about experimenting, and this is our first thing we're experimenting with. So stick around. We're not going anywhere. I love to hear that. I love this idea that Dungeon Defenders, when I first played it over a decade ago, it was just this cute little game, you know, tower defense, that you're in the action. I never thought it would become this world in this franchise. What has building that lore and world out been like? Oh, it's been a ton of fun. I mean, you know what? I'm going to just say thank you to all our fans and community. We would not be here without you and your support and your love, basically. It's passion. Yeah. We see the passion you put into the game, and that fuels us to make more cool, fun stuff. I love that. This game is available currently on Early Access. Do you guys have a timeline for when you're going to have the full release ready to go? It'll be later in the year. We don't have an exact date yet. We do want to spend time and really polish this and get the feedback. That's why we're in Early Access. We really want to get thousands of players to see fill out our surveys and tell us what you like, what you don't like, so you can really put the final polish on this game. And after it releases on PC, are there plans to put that elsewhere? Yes, we plan on pouring this to consoles. And is that all consoles? Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's always the answer, right? Yeah, you never know. Yeah, yeah. so hopefully. Yeah, these are plans, not promises at the moment. Yeah. Now, if folks wanted to get in on the action of Dungeon Defenders but don't have a PC and want to play other games, what other games could they jump into? Yeah, so Dungeon Defenders Awaken is on Xbox, soon to be PlayStation, Nintendo, PC. Our second game, Dungeon Defenders 2, is on Xbox, PlayStation, PC. And our first game is on Steam, yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. The last thing I'll ex ask you to do as you have a saying on the show, happy gaming. We always want people to enjoy the games they're playing. So you could just say your name and then say, remember, happy gaming. We'll sign off. <laughs> My name's Augie, here representing Dungeon Affairs Going Rogue. 
Happy gaming is all about having fun and being a good person. Thank you. So we're here chatting with Fred and Eric from Tribute Games. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me and Jeff. It's a pleasure to be pleasure here. Pleasure to be here. We're so excited about this new TMNT game. I grew up watching this cartoon. I'm a diehard Rob Paulson fan specifically. Wow, cool. And so like, I've been following his career for ages. Just before PAX East, y'all announced that the original 80s cast are reprising their roles. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, when we started the game, you know, we really wanted to make sure that this would be the ultimate homage to the first generation of the cartoons, you know, the 87 era and everything. And it was just a dream come true for us to be able to get our hands on that and make the best game ever with this. At one point, while we were writing the game, it became like kind of obvious, like, how can we make it sound as much as possible as just like the show? And Dadimu, our partner publisher, was just like, well, let's just ask the, good, the, yeah. let's go get the cast. Why not? <laughs> Most of them are still working. Same with the animation, the intro animation. It's like there's no expenses, you know? It's just like, why not? Let's go get that theme or let's go get that music. Let's go clear the rights to the original music. So we wanted to do a love letter to the classic 87 cartoon. Like go and reference, obviously, like the arcade game, Turtles in Time, and just make something that's that will pay homage, pay tribute to what was the Turtles for my 13-year-old self, 12-year-old self. So that's exactly what we we're seeing today, and it's just overwhelming. Now I have one follow-up question about the voice acting. Obviously, James Avery is no longer with us. Yes. Are you digitizing cartoon stuff for him, or are you having someone else do the role? Uh, we had to take, of course, someone else to do the role because it's always touchy, you know, like you want to pay respect, but at the same time, you don't want to kind of use something like we want to honor the memory and not step those boundaries for sure. So we took a, uh, another actor for some. Well, and we also have like some other actor coming in for different other voices. That's amazing. So let's talk a little bit about this game. Ninja Turtles and beat em up have gone together since the early, early days of video games. What what inspired you to continue that tradition, especially after we've seen such a variety of Turtles games over the years? Wow, it's a tough question. I mean, it's Tribute never really did a beat em up and we uh, we wanted to do one, that's for sure. Tribute, Tribute game is 10 years old. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary, going on 11. And we always worked on our own IPs. And if we wanted to jump and touch an IP, it needed to be something really special. And the Turtles obviously was one of them. So we had the IP, the dream IP, and we had to beat him up that we needed to do at one point in our catalog, because we had sort of a roguelike, like a platformer, a couple platformers, a brick breaker, you know, and we wanted to pay tribute to that genre, but pay tribute to that genre in the most amazing way possible. And that's what we have today. And, and also some of the founding members, uh, Jean-Francois and Jonathan, like the both co-founders, uh, previously worked on Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, which is uh, another... You can totally feel that. Yeah. Exactly. Sure. Beat him up. Uh, and they, the guys also even worked on uh, the TMNT uh, game for the, the Game Boy Advance, you know, the, the, the game based on the animated movie that came out at the beginning of 2000. And the GBA version was basically another beat him up. And it was a different kind of beat him up, like from Turtles in Time and such, but still, it, it was already there, so... So that pass from Tribute, it's now a part of Tribute. So they have all that knowledge of beat em ups and all that clout and that energy and those connections with Bob Robertson and everything. So it's just like, just the perfect merge and like the timing was just great. And GF worked really hard to get the license with Dotty Mute so we could have that opportunity. And I think it was a process that took over six years of just like poking them. And finally, somehow with Dotty Mute, uh, things happened. And uh, yeah, we're really proud. It's amazing. Yeah, fantastic. And I mean, clearly the love for the property is all right there for all to see and all to enjoy. I and mean, there have been a lot of releases of Turtle Properties, Turtle beat em up like games over the years, different generations. What has either been the big breakthrough or the big feel? Because I got to tell you, this one feels like the games I remember. What makes it feel like those classic games for you? So, of course, you know, the games you remember, in your memory, it's always perfect. It was oh, the best time fun. ever. And then when you play them again, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, the controls were limited. You know, it's a bit re repetitive and everything. But you know, at Tribute Games, we're really good like at bringing those memories, but making sure that they're modern, you know? So there's a lot of few things from, from the start that we knew that had to change. Like one small detail that doesn't get enough showcases, for example, is when you knock the enemies off screen, back in the old games, you would just spend your time waiting for them to walk back in and just, you know, hit 
on the edges of the screen, but now the edges of the screen are collision. So you can actually, they bounce back and they stay on the fight. So you can juggle with them. So what, juggling becomes something no more, yeah. now that is part of the game. So you can get crazy combos, like just like going and exactly. uh, on enemies off the screen. When there's four players, it's just chaotic and everything bouncing from, from everywhere, from every side. It's just so fun to look at. And also like, just in terms of gameplay, also in terms of moves and everything. Like, oh, now that we have like more complex game paths and everything, so we decided also add more depth without going too crazy and still staying true to the original games. Like having more options, like for example, adding a backflip button so you can use it for combos. Uh, also uh, change the way that we trigger the special moves, uh, give more depth to like all of the combo system, but mostly having six playable characters that control the same, but all feel different and all have their own unique moves. So. Yeah, it looks like they all have different attributes when we were selecting our characters. There's a few different things there. And yeah, I would imagine it's a couple different ways that play out. Were there any debates that came up in trying to determine how each turtle plays or how they weigh out or anything? Because there's, I'm sure there's strong opinions about that. I mean, not really, because I think that the way that they're built is really like how their personality works. Like, for example, Mikey is the, the goofball, you know, he's the party dude. So he had to be the fast guy with the moves that would go overboard a bit crazy. And then we'd have like someone who, like Donatello, who's more like rational, so more calculated. So maybe a bit slower, but also as more efficient because he has such a and wide range. range. Obviously, because of the ball, because of his exactly. weapon. Well, then that answers my question as to what if you pull from the original Turtles game on the NES? <laughs> so we had to respect the, the usual tropes of the Turtles and the, and the games, obviously. But we took some liberties. Like you were saying, like April feels really different from Splinter because they're really like polarized. And they give you a totally different experience. Yeah. So you could do like a solo run with April, go back, start another game with, with Splinter and have a total different experience. Your gameplay will be slower. With Splinter, you, you have like the step back, take your time, strategize. With April, she's so quick and you can like chain combos like crazy. You dodge, you get in a sticky situation, you would dodge with her. With Splinter, Raphael, you have to be a bit more careful. So strategies are different, the experience is different. So you mentioned the music before, and the music in all of the Ninja Turtles games are iconic. Yeah. And from the opening moments of this game, it sounds so familiar to the games from before without being exactly the same. Talk about that process and, make, and working with the composer to create a tribute while still doing something new. So we worked with uh, T. Lopes on the project. So T. Lopes, who uh, just did like the Sonic Mania soundtrack. Mm -hmm. So a very talented guy, a super awesome dude. Like, he's a great composer and he really loved that source material for sure. So when we approached him, he was like uber excited. And right from the start, you know, he got he, he got the notes right with the MIDI trumpets and the music, like the, the beats and everything. So it, it's pretty cool and it goes like above and beyond. Like I think people will be surprised when they listen to the whole soundtrack of the game because we go to places that the TMNT games have never been before for sure. He had the same approach as we did with the gameplay and the mechanics. He sort of remixed with respect, with good references, with a good ear, but it's new, it's retro at the same time, and he paid homages, he did an amazing job. It was just like taking like some references here and there, and just like putting that into music, and on his original compositions also. Yeah, we're really proud of his work. It was amazing working with him. We've definitely found that the games that, as you said, that you try to, if you're going back to a game, you do it how you remember it, not how it actually was. If you if you ape it too much, it's a problem. You gotta iterate and build on it, and that is clear for every facet of what we've seen so far. Yeah, my last question is: beat 'em ups are just as important as their moves, and we've talked quite a bit about the moves that the turtles, April and Splinter, have in this game. My favorite move from the classic games that you, of course, brought back to this game is the screen throw, where you throw the enemy at the screen. Yeah. A thing that I feel like is just core to the Ninja Turtles experience, even though it only appeared in one game. I'm curious, do you guys have a favorite move from a favorite character? Oh, I think my favorite one is the throw from Raphael. Like, he does this suplex throw, which uh, is kind of reminiscent from the fighting games that they have. And it, it, I think it's just so badass, and I think, it, yeah, it, it is my favorite move. When I saw it first time, in the game, I was like, okay, now I believe it. Like, it's all about, like I, like I was saying, having a Turtles, they all have the same kind of overall move list, but they don't do the same thing. And I think that that was the moment where it became all uh, very obvious. Uh, I got two. Mikey's bicycle kick. What's the real name of that bicycle kick? It's a, uh, it's a super flying kick. It's like a multi-hip just climbing. Yeah, he just bicycles like the, uh, anyway. Uh, Mikey's special is just plain amazing. 
and uh, also April's backflip special. She does just a really long combo of all her punches and every like move she makes, it's just a really long combo of all those. And with a, like a strike at the end, it's just, yeah, it ends it's up like amazing. A, like a, it's so epic. Combo. It's by far like the longest combo of the game. So folks are, <laughs> folks are clamoring for this game. We know it's coming out yeah. soon-ish. Do you guys have an idea of when it's going to come out and also the platforms it'll be available on? So the game is coming out this summer, so in a few months. We yeah. swear, we promise. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. And uh, the game is coming out for PC, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, so basically everything. So it's going to be awesome. All consoles, and you can wish list it uh, now on Steam. Amazing. So. Is there going to be online co-op with this or only oh. local? The multiplayer is online and offline, and it's jump in, jump out at any time. Players jump in, I mean, you can leave your session open while playing with a friend in your living room and somebody online can join in. So this is all supported and what's cool about it is that the game will scale itself accordingly. So if you play solo, you'll have an experience with a set number of enemies and, you know, different enemy patterns. But if you play four players, you'll have a lot more enemies to tackle. So it's not an easier challenge just because you're playing four players. So. That's my favorite thing. My most frustrating thing with modern beat em ups, like I love River City Girls. But the fact that the co-op is only offline, that you can't go online with that first game, is a bummer to me. But just the same, I love playing on the couch with a friend, and so that kind of co-mingling of those play styles are really important, so I'm glad that it's going to have that. It's very important for us, too. I mean, especially after spending a year like that, you know, with a pandemic, with people at home and everything. I mean, right from the start, we had to develop a co-op online anyway, so... <laughs> because the game is made to be enjoyed with friends, so it's now it's pretty hard like that to, to have four friends at home it's, it's you know we, we don't know what could happen so let's say you're only two at home and you need to be four it will be pretty easy to get two friends or like two random players to jump in so that's the whole objective this is a party game and i think we, we had to make like all the efforts possible so it remained a party game so regardless of your situation Absolutely. Well, your passion for the property, for the game, for the experience is evident through thank all of it and through everything that we've talked about here. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today and for giving us a few minutes with this game. I didn't realize I could get more excited for it. It's amazing to hear. I'm really honored to have you. To have everyone finally be able to play it. The last thing I'll ask you to do is we have a catchphrase on our podcast. It's happy gaming. It's this idea of finding joy in gaming. So you can just say your names and then say, remember happy gaming. We'll close out the interview. All right. So I'm Fred. I'm Eric. Remember, Remember happy, happy gaming. gaming. Hi, it's Frankie Bradley here from Certain Point of View Media, and I am at PAX East, currently with the founder of Geekify Inc. John, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. I would love to let our listeners know a little bit more about your company and your background. Sure. Well, thanks for, for joining us here today. We are a merch making company. We are a solution for turning ideas into physical products for people. So you know those ideas you have and you're like, I wish someone would make that thing. We're the people to do that. So we turn the process into a far more painless process of um, taking your idea and turn it into, we often do merchandise, we do product lines, we do special projects, props, cosplay accessories. And we work with everyone from individuals all the way up to AAA studios and game and film and movie companies doing special needs projects because you need someone to make the thing and we are a versatile and agile solution for doing that. I am standing right here in the booth looking around at the products and they are all so amazing and lovingly crafted. What originally drew me to this booth was this set of beautiful class-inspired backpacks. They are absolutely stunning and there are more classes coming out. Can you talk a little bit about the process behind those bags, the inspiration and release dates? Sure. Well, our company kind of exists to make everyday life a little more magical. That's kind of our operating philosophy here. It's like, what would you want as part of an artifact of your favorite world? And we hit upon this idea to do these character class inspired backpacks that we dubbed Bags of Splendor. And we had uh, six different classes. So we had a necromancer, a fighter, a mage, a sorcerer, a druid, and then sort of a, a paladin type. So we set about kind of looking at what would make good color palettes, what defines each character class. The necromancer is a little more stitched together, hodgepodge as a, you know, the flesh of his enemies versus the, the paladin, which looks more like plate mail armor put together with dragon skin, that, you know, from a slain beast. So overall, it was fun putting together what we thought looked cool for each character class to make the bags that you see. They are gorgeous, but I am still a little salty about the lack of a rogue class bag. <laughs> 
I also see here that you cover a wide range of media types. There are books, there's video games, there's tabletop gaming. Is there a certain type of media that you like working in? My favorite, well, we got our start with leather crafting. So anything that's leather work is always fun. The, the leather bound books that we do are uh, one of our bread and butter products. But my personal favorite is working with video games because I loved collecting collector's editions when I was a kid. Getting that box set, getting all the cool trinkets, you know, combing eBay to find that thing from decades later that you didn't get to buy when you were a kid. So we've worked with a lot of video game companies to help span the, the digital divide that's kind of evolved where a company might do a Kickstarter, promise all these physical rewards, and they've got their development well in hand for doing the digital copy of the game, but no one knows where to go to get box sets or to get you know the cool swag anymore. So that's kind of been a lot of fun of helping work with those developers, some of which were developers from games that we played as kids. And as they continue to grow in the industry or move on to their next projects, we get to help them with their next generation of stuff. So it's truly come full circle of bearing witness to the growth of the industry and growing up with them as our idols and rock stars and being able to work directly with them nowadays. That's amazing. Is there a specific project that is perhaps your favorite or has a special place in your heart? Or is that too hard of a question? No. Hero You and Perception. So Perception was uh, from the developers of the Bioshock games. So they went on to found their own indie studio and made a fantastic horror game. And then the Hero U game was from the old Sierra developers of Quest for Glory. And those were old, old-timey DOS games, and I absolutely loved them. And I didn't realize that they were still in the business of making games. So when I saw that they were running a Kickstarter, we reached out immediately. It's like, whatever it needs to take, <laughs> we want to help with this. We want to be part of this project and to help see it succeed and flourish. And I think the, the final result was fantastic because we got to work directly with those developers and our heroes to help them make their next dream a reality. That's amazing. That must be such an incredible feeling to bring those things to life. Yesterday, we discussed a little bit that your background, like you, I am also an English major. You heard me, an English major. <laughs> What's it been like taking that experience that you've had and that training and trying to adapt it into a different type of industry? I'd say the only place that that really truly helps is in writing great product descriptions. So a couple of good photos and a good catchy description goes a long way. But mm, I come from a creative background. So doing Odyssey of the Mind, having parents who were engineering types, uh, having uh, uncles who were engineering types. One of them's a rocket scientist in NASA. So it's like the ability to think creatively and problem solve has always been part of my family. But it's cool getting to work creatively and, and do problem solving on literally every single project that crosses our path because it's solving the problems and staying one step ahead of the people who are asking the questions of what they need. So they say, I want this particular product. We say, okay, these are the things you need to keep in mind because we've made these things and school of hard knocks, we know how they get made now. So each year that we learn more and more and more about how things get made, we offer a better quality service for each of our future clients as a result from all of the learning that we've had to do along the way. I love that. I am also a creative type, so I know that one of the most fun things is learning a new process and then getting to do it all the time. Is there a process that you've had to teach yourself and had to develop that you just employ all the time now? Laser cutting. So we have a workshop of a bajillion and a half different tools. It's essentially a hacker space <laughs> to, to private purpose. We have laser cutters, we've got CNC routers, we've got wide format printers. We just got a UV printer, which can print on just about any kind of material. And it's awesome to come into these completely blind and not having any idea how they work, learning to use the machine and then putting them towards the, the projects that we've got. Because anyone can do you know, a branded sticker, a branded mug or a t-shirt, but it's cool getting to take these tools and use them in ways that they were never intended to be used to kind of push the boundaries and the limits of what can be done for cool merch. Because our mission statement is to create the things that you want to have on your shelf 20 years later, not the thing that's going to get discarded at the end of the day. So how do we take those tools that everyone might have in a workshop and use them in new and creative ways? That's fantastic. Ah, that just speaks to my soul in such a very special way. Is there any projects coming up, any things that you're currently developing that you would like to make people aware of? 
Our two big ones right now that we're working on are uh, stuff for Neopets, revitalizing the old Neopets brand that is now 22 years old and still going strong, and stuff for The Last Unicorn. We got that license a couple years ago and it is now celebrating its 40th anniversary. We did a tarot deck for it a number of years ago and we are just continuing to build out the stuff that we wanted to have when we were younger and making it a reality for the next generation. I want a last unicorn tarot deck. <laughs> you have them here? All right, I, I'm gonna be shopping. As everyone on our network knows, I very much love finding fun products. I think that's about it. So John, if you could please share with our listeners where they can find you, all the social medias and the hashtags. We are at Geekify Inc. That's I-N-C, like incorporated. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. I really appreciate it. You're an incredible artist, and I'm so glad that we've made this connection. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for coming by. All right, and that's it for me. Thanks, everyone. Hey, we're still here at PAX East, and I'm with the lead game designer and original creator of Curse to Golf, Liam. Liam, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So we just got done playing it. I guess the first question is why a golf Metroidvania puzzle game? Long story short, I was listening to a podcast about roguelikes, and I was thinking, why has nobody done a physics roguelike? And the reason is because it's a really bad idea. Uh, <laughs> RNG is unpredictable, and physics is unpredictable. So when you combine those two things, it sounds like a really frustrating time for a player. But I kind of stuck with it, and I was like, there's something here. So I was basically just building like mini uh, Game Boy Metroid dungeons and then bouncing a ball around in it. And I was like, oh, this is a bit like golf. Golf is something I used to play when I was younger. So I knew the rules of it. And what's so good about sports games is that they already have like predefined rules that everybody kind of understands. Like if I tell like tennis, even if you don't play tennis, you know, tennis involves like hitting a ball between two people. The literal motions. Literal motions, right? So with golf, you know, the barrier to entry is already there. Players know they're going to hit a ball and it's going to do stuff. So then all it was is about like just experimenting with like, okay, well, what if instead of falling in water, what if you could freeze the water? And then you know you start laying out this dungeon with loads of water and you're like well the player has the ability to cut these water out oh this is kind of like a puzzle now so uh, i don't know it just kept building on from there it seems like there was something there i don't know i could be the stupidest dude in the world and it's terrible but it seems okay so far well what we played so far has been a lot of fun and you said you've maintained the rogue light or rogue like aspects but how have you sort of created the balance of abstraction of that so that it's not quite as random as a pure procedural generation that's it, pretty much why we try to step away from saying it's a roguelike or a roguelike purely. Fair enough. We call it a golf-like <laughs> because it's not quite golf and it's not quite a roguelike. It's a golf-like. So it's like equal parts Mario Golf and equal parts like Slay the Spire or something. For us, it's mostly about the fun. So it's not about the pure like, oh, you know, this is completely random and stuff like that. There are a lot of things that are designed in your favor. But there's also a lot of things that you yourself can do to help yourself, right? For example, everything is based on buying packs in a shop. So you know what you're buying. You're not being given random rewards. You have more control over that. Also, because the holes themselves are not procedurally generated, there's more familiarization with the more you play, the better you get because you're like, I've been here before. I know where I'm going. So it's not completely random to a point. You could play it infinitely and you would eventually know everything about it. Whereas if you played Spelunky infinitely, you might not. So it's a bit of a balance between taking the parts we like about roguelikes and then making this sort of hybrid that is a golf-like. It's very much playing through the idea of, well, when one plays golf, they play the course and so they can learn the course that way. Exactly, exactly. It is a case of like, uh, people play the same golf course for like 20 years, right? And they just keep wanting to get better and better. Some days you're really good, some days you're really bad. But the idea here is that you're gonna have good runs, you're gonna have bad runs, but as long as you feel like, oh, I, I know what I could have done there, right? I could have used this ace card or I could have used this spin mechanic or something. It means that the next time you jump in, you're like, I'm going to get better this time. I want to talk a little bit about the aesthetics because it's my favorite kind of indie aesthetics. It looks like a Super Nintendo game that could never run on a Super Nintendo, <laughs> much like our favorite game, Shovel Knight, which is very much looks like a Nintendo game, but could never run on a Nintendo. Talk a little bit about the creation of the aesthetic and the design and the sound. And was that the goal to get that kind of retro feel? Uh, yeah, 100% from the beginning. So when I made the original prototype, I'm a really bad artist. Um, so it was just me trying to do what I could, but it was always going to be inspired by games that I love. I grew up loving Nintendo. I live in Kyoto, Japan. I'm surrounded by Nintendo all the time. Uh, it was always going to be like this, almost, I think of it as like a, a Super Nintendo game that nobody found. Yeah. Like it's this kind of Super Nintendo that nobody found. Our pixel artist, John, 
is just incredible. He can do everything. And uh, we, we figured out really quickly, it was kind of like based around how much of the hole could you see on the screen at one time. And then we kind of like made the proportions of the character and everything. And then it worked out very nicely that it was exactly the Super Nintendo feeling we were going for. Shovel Knight is a great example. Like a lot of people do compare it to Shovel Knight in the kind of the way it looks, but we're like the Super Nintendo version, right? Yeah. They're the NES version, we're the Super Nintendo version. In terms of not only the aesthetic of like the way it looks, but the way it sounds to the gameplay is all from like our kind of philosophy of following Nintendo and those kind of like find the fun things. Our musician is a musician called Mark Sparling. He did the soundtrack to A Short Hike, which is a beautiful indie yeah, game. I love that game. And I'm just such a major big fan of his. And I was like, hey man, can you please write all this weird golf Castlevania music? And he was like, yeah, cool. And here we are. We got this amazing sounding. I'm entirely biased, but like it's incredible to me. So I get to enjoy it as well because I, I don't know how to make music or make art. So yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, been a lot of fun. Fantastic. No, and. We, we share in that enjoyment. So what is the current timeline of development release for Curse the Golf? So we've been developing it since January of last year. We're scheduled to release this summer. So summer 2022, we've been working really hard. That terrifies me because it's April and we're about to be May. But fingers crossed, summer 2022, we're coming to uh, Steam, Nintendo Switch and Xbox. It's gonna be great. This seems like the perfect kind of pick up and play Nintendo Switch game. Was that the plan for it, just to be this kind of game that you can pick up and play whenever you have a few free minutes? Uh, pretty much, yeah. It's um, Everyone keeps asking, like, is it going to come to Nintendo Switch? And I'm like, of course. It's like, yeah. why would it not, right? Yeah. Um, I love playing the Nintendo Switch. I recently got a Steam Deck as well, which is very reminiscent of the Nintendo Switch. And I've been playing this on my Steam Deck, and I'm like, wow, this is really good. <laughs> so it was always a good case. I mean... It's a Nintendo game in spirit. Yeah. Uh, so it was always, and for me as like a Nintendo kid growing up, I'm going to see my game on a Nintendo store. This is going to be amazing. Did you grow up playing any golf games on Nintendo and Super Nintendo? Uh, yeah, like I actually quite like sports. So I don't play golf anymore, but I did when I was younger. But I do like sports. I'm a big fan of arcade sports games. So like stuff like FIFA and uh, Madden or whatever, it doesn't really bother me. But Mario Golf or Mario Strikers or like old Konami sports games and stuff. Games that do what we kind of do with Curse to Golf, which is take that predefined rule set and make it a little more spicy, make it a little more fun. Like going back and just playing like loads of old golf games for research for this was so much fun. I got absolutely addicted to Neo Turf Masters, which is just easily the best golf game ever. If anybody ever says to me like, Neo Turf Masters was my favorite golf game until Curse to Golf came along, I've done my job right. Because that game fucking rules. So yeah, there's loads of that. The pixel art itself, you know, it's inspired by Super Nintendo games of old, but our UI is this clean vector UI to be easily readable, but it's also meant to be like inspired by older Konami games and a bit more like golf aesthetic and stuff. So we've taken little bits of old golf games that we like and sort of smooshed them together. I'm curious about the accessibility options. A lot of roguelikes yeah. and those the like, like Hades famously with their god mode, gave you options to help you with the game if you're struggling. Does Curse to Golf have options like that? So in the final build of the game, what we're aiming for is to have like basically what we call a practice round menu. And that just, we want people to play it how they want to play it. Like we have our Curse to Golf, right? right? Same as like Dark Souls has its thing. And Celeste, I think is the greatest example for this for us. That has the game that the developers want you to play. I always think that's really important. But not everybody wants to play that version of that game. So we want to add a menu uh, called the practice round settings. And in there, you should be able to tweak like how many shots a statue gives you or like how many ace cards you might get in a booster pack or, you know, various different things that would allow you to practice the game and then feel like you could take on the version that we've designed. So we try to aim to make it as playable by everybody. What's the point of making a video game if 50% of people can't play it. I love that. I think it's just so much to the core of what brings people together with games. And I think that there's, like I've recently become a fan of the Souls games and there's a space for those games that are just hard that you hit the wall and you learn to overcome it. But I think a game like this, especially when it's cheery and fun and light, you want to give those kinds of options and accessibility. Exactly. exactly. I mean, I just want everybody to play it and have fun. <laughs> like, I don't think Shigeru or Miyamoto sat at home and was like, no, this has to be nails hard, right? Right. Yeah, like it's just, Make it fun, right? Mario has lots of those baby modes or whatever, but as long as some additional person gets to experience what we get to experience, then that's great, right? So yeah, hopefully it also encourages people who maybe were intimidated by that roguelike nature to after a while take it on and then feel even more satisfied because then they feel like they played the 
proper version or something like that. So yeah, we don't want to stop anybody from playing it. We're not like, no, this is our perfectly designed piece or whatever. So no, we uh, we definitely want to add it. It's kind of hard to balance, like uh, especially with achievements and stuff like that. But we'll we'll stick it in somehow. Awesome, very Fan cool, fantastic. No, uh, I gotta say, we're just very excited for this to come out whenever it does. Summer twenty twenty two can't come fast enough. <laughs> if I do my job right, <laughs> then it will. Fair enough. No thank pressure. you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you for chatting with us. The last thing we'll do is we have a catchphrase on the show, which is "Happy Gaming." Hi, I'm Liam. I'm the game director of Coast of Golf, and happy gaming. We're chatting with Mario, the head of Cool to Play. Mario, we're here to talk about your gun. Jeff just got to play it. Tell the listeners a little bit about what your gun is. Yeah. Hi, guys and girls. Uh, yeah, my name is Mario, and uh, I'm working with my team on your gun, and we are really thrilled to be here and show this game to, to you. And uh, your gun, the, the way we like to think about your gun is that your gun is top down doom. It's like a game where you have a top-down perspective and a camera. You have uh, two weapons, two skills, hit resource that you're going to manage in a split second, taking decisions whether you want to spend it defensively or offensively. So, yeah, for us, it's like a top-down Doom, the game where a lot of stuff happens, where you get into the flow uh, of a combat that is really fluid and fast-paced. But also, there's some narrative in this game and a story and a kind of a charming story. I <laughs> also like to think of the story that is charming. It's about relation between machine mech that you're going to play and your pilot that is missing because you wake up from a long slumber, humanity is gone, the wall has collapsed, you don't know what happened, you don't know where your pilot is. So. The only thing you want to do is to find her, yeah? So there is like this bond between machine and a man and uh, this is what drives you in this game as a, as a protagonist, yeah? Yeah, and it definitely has that flow state that you were talking about. It. It's very much it's a twin stick shooter with a lot of bullet hell feelings about it and a lot of intensity. Yeah. But the narrative is very engaging as it sort of keys through and weaves throughout. Now, how can folks that don't play a lot of shoot 'em up games but still want to engage in the narrative are there ways that people are able to access those? Because shoot 'em up games are very typically hard as a rule. So how yeah. are people able to get through the levels? We thought about, a lot about it. And um, as of now, we don't have like a difficulty system. Right. Instead of that, we have a scoring system that is connected to the live system. So if you are a really skilled player, there's still a lot to improve. Uh, on your play and this is reflected by the scoring system if you are not that really deep into the twin stick shooter games uh, you have life so you can fail during play but you can really easily pick up where you left off because you have uh, three lives and this will influence impact your scoring system so for the players who uh, like to you know optimize and have uh, better scores they have to play better don't use their lives and you know have a better score for the players who uh, maybe need some more of a guidance or you know uh, patience with the game they have those lives so they are not frustrated by you know starting levels from the scratch and uh, you know we starting from uh, from the beginning so what i love about your gun is the style and the design it's got what i like to call the kind of indie feel the geometry of the stages the top down it's very pretty but also very simplistic and easy to navigate was that kind of part of the plan so people can really get around the levels and know the flow for the fighting yeah we worked a lot on the visuals for the game to be basically attractive nice and and, and a pleasure to watch and um, our game designer fan he was like really caring about all the you know visual stuff that is going on in the game and he was saying like uh i just care uh, for the game to be pretty you know <laughs> Obviously, we want the game to be like uh, easily readable and accessible for the players. So you know where you are, you don't know where enemies are, you know what is going on, despite like, you know, sometimes 20 things blowing up around yourself. So we've put a lot of work and effort into that. And uh, we'll put even more because we know there is uh, still a real uh, for improvement. So uh, yeah, we are really happy that you like the visuals and, uh, and the style of the game. And so your gun is out now in early access on Steam. How much of the game can people play right now if they go to early access? If you go to the Steam and, and buy the game for the 15 bucks, you can play for around two and a half, three hours. If you are quite skilled player, I would say, mm -hmm. for the players who need our life system, <laughs> this could extend a bit. 
but this is pretty much what we have now and this is like three different biomes Barcelona Hong Kong uh, where we play on the rooftops of the skyscrapers and the northern cascades uh, in America three biomes uh, that are divided into different districts 25 missions all together and we want to expand on that in the full release up to five to six hours let's say also with some different kind of missions like challenge missions where you have some kind of constraints and rules that are necessary to complete the missions and maybe different modes we also explore and different modes for the game like survival or like more arcade uh, you know a score driven mode mm -hmm. so yeah this is something we would love to do and we give ourselves like six to 12 months to finalize on the game and listen to your feedback so uh, we really encourage you to play the game share your feedback on Steam. it helps us a lot also join our discord server and just write whatever you think about the game we respond to any feedback and yeah we would just uh, love to to hear from you one thing i want to ask in the vein of release and the timeline Obviously a game like this, and you and I were talking about this before the interview, this game screams the Nintendo Switch, right? Yeah. Handheld. Yeah, yeah. Is there a plan for a console rollout? Do you guys, after its final release, want to get it on consoles as well? Exactly. This is our plan. First, we want to finalize the game, the content-wise, design-wise, art-wise. Once it's ready to be shipped, we're going to port it to consoles and the handhelds. It already plays pretty nice on a Steam Deck, so you can play it and try it. And of course, it's our dream to have it on a Nintendo Switch too. Yeah, sure. It's yeah, just yeah. It, there's an aesthetic of independent games that, like Jeff and I always talk about, like Shovel Knight and yeah. you know Celeste. These games that look like they could run on older systems, mm -hmm. but are much nicer and more powerful. Yeah, and I totally get that vibe from this game. Is this based on games from when you were younger, or games that you loved growing up that were like twin stick shooters? Yeah, sure. It, it kind of a, uh, I said uh, we think about this game as a top-down Doom, but in fact it's like a really homage to the classic arcade Twin Stick shooters. We love housemark games like Resogun and Next Machina. That was a huge inspiration. Like uh, Titanfall 2, huge inspiration for the relationship of a machine and a human. Of course, this is all like uh, on a much smaller scale. This sure. indie game. But uh, we hope you can feel a bit of that, you know, in our game too, which is like classic arcade bullet hell shooter game. But uh, yeah, we have a bit of that vibe, like sentimental vibe in this game too. Yeah. And no, I can definitely feel that. No, it's fantastic. There's a, I got to try a lot of the great like weapon loadouts and there's such a great amount of customization within the game already uh, with your mech loadouts and everything else. Are there plans to expand on that? Or I mean, it's got plenty already. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, there is some things you can fiddle with and, and, and you know, tune this mech to your liking. But uh, honestly, we want to have like much, much more. <laughs> so uh, including visual customization, uh, of course, we didn't manage to have it all in a game. Also like with the narrative, there is narrative in game, like a text and a dialogues, but there are also comic pages that present some of the backstory retrospectively to the apocalypse. So uh, what was your relation between your pilot and the mag? We have like three pages now, yeah? We don't have a lot of more. The same with visual customization and like mechanical customization for the mag, yeah? So how the mag behaves, reacts to the enemies, projectiles and the stuff. The same with weapons, expansion cartridges. We have like uh, five guns now, five different weapons. Uh, four different heat attacks, around 10 expansion cartridges that change behavior of the Mac, and around 20 mods for the weapons, and we definitely want to have more. So now the most important question, if you had to pick one of the five weapons as your favorite, yeah. which is your favorite weapon? It's really difficult questions. I really love to play them all, but there is something about Boomerang, you know, that Ooh. it's like, you know, it's not easy to play, but once you position this boomerang weapon, we call it plasma disc, by the way, but uh, boomerang describes it well, how it works. Right. You just toss it and it gets back. It, it stays for a while in one place, spinning around, dealing a lot of tick damage, and then it goes back. So it's so satisfying, you know, when you toss it like really nicely, position yourself nicely, so it gets other enemies on the way back, you know? It's such a fun to play with this weapon. Yeah. I love that. Well, Mario, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Yeah. Last thing I'll ask you to do is we have a catchphrase on the podcast. It's happy gaming. Remember, happy gaming. 
Hey folks, we're here with Stephen, who is the community manager for Iodine Chronicle Rising. Stephen, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. So Jeff and I just got to play it. We're really excited. Tell, I guess, the listener first just a little bit about what Iodine Chronicle Rising is. So Iodin Chronicle Hunter Heroes was the number one backed Kickstarter game of 2020. And it was so successful that we added a companion game as an extra bonus. And this is that companion game. It comes out May 10th and it introduces some of the cool characters that will be eventually be your companions in 100 Heroes. And it's available on every major platform. It is an action RPG. And, you know, it's a, a bit different than the actual 100 Heroes, which is a JRPG, but it's really smooth action, beautiful scenery, and it's 2.5D, and we're really excited to show it off at PAX East. Given that it is a sort of, uh, whether it was a stretch goal or just a companion piece, is this meant to be, is this a short game? Is this a quick game? Or is this in itself a full standalone title that one can enjoy if they're more of an action RPG player than a JRPG? Yeah, it's definitely a full title. You know, it's 20 plus hours long, fun gameplay loop, really good story. So, you know, you'll be able to sink your teeth into something. And if you complete the game, there's content that transfers over to 100 Heroes. So this is like a prequel to 100 Heroes? Yes, you can call it a prequel to 100 Heroes. It takes place before the actual story that takes place in 100 Heroes. Awesome. Talk a little bit about the aesthetic, because we've seen a lot of 2D HD kind of things with sprite work meets 3D animation. Where do you think the soul of this style of game comes from, especially for this particular version? Well, the developers for the game are Natsumi Atari. The actual core 100 Heroes is developed by Rabbit and Bear Studios, who are the original creators of Suikoden. And, you know, that's considered one of the top JRPGs of all time. And they have an amazing style that they've created. And they tell stories and create characters in such a beautiful and profound way. And there's a great following online. So all of this is congruent with that style, that way of, you know, creating a world. And Hunter Heroes brings that to life. And Rising, which was made in collaboration with Rabbit and Bear Studios, keeps that going. And while it is an action RPG, which is very different than all of it, what you can see just by looking at the characters and reading the dialogue, that it's all congruent. Now, given that there is such a predicate to the people designing behind it, can fans of the Suikoden series or other series that the creators have worked on, can they expect any sort of Easter eggs or any sort of nods or anything? I don't know of any nods specifically to like Suikoden or anything along those lines, but if you play the game, you'll definitely see the team at Rabbit and Bear. They have a very distinct fingerprint and style for making games. And it's great storytelling at the end of the day. So you said this is going to be available on every single platform. So we're talking Switch, Xbox, PlayStation, PC. Correct. All of those. Was that always the goal from the beginning to make it multi-platform? Or is it something that y'all built to as you were designing this game? It was always the plan to make it multi-platform. I mean, if you look at the success of the Kickstarter 2020 campaign, the community largely agrees they want this, we want to deliver it to them, and, you know, it's also going to be day one Game Pass on Xbox. So, you know, the hype is real, it's going to be huge, and we want to deliver it to fans in every way we can possibly deliver it. Do you have a release date for Rising? Yeah, it's May 10th, and uh, but we don't have a release date uh, that we've announced for 100 Heroes. Got it. But do you think they'll both be within this year? Do you have a like a projection? We, we did project it's in 2023 and we released that, but we have not revealed the exact date. Now, the demo that we played, we played as one of the, uh, I suppose, playable characters, CJ. Do you have a particular uh, favorite playable character uh, for you when you play Ayuda? So you can play as CJ, Isha, or Garu. CJ is your main character. So when you're walking around town, you're going to be mostly be playing with CJ, but the other companion characters will be following around. I think in combat, in the dungeons, when you're walking around outside of town, Garu is fairly OP because, you know, he can take down shields of enemies and, you know, he's a, a bit tougher. So I definitely enjoy playing him, but you can't traverse the world efficiently with him. Isha, she can teleport around and CJ, the climbing gear that she has is the, the easiest to traverse in the dash as well. Amazing. I'm curious with the development of the game and the scope and setting, can you talk a little bit about the aesthetics, the music especially, which is very reminiscent of JRPG style games and those kinds of like? Oh, I mean, the, the music's great. Some of the songs, like some of the boss songs, great. Just the Quarry song. You know, it's your typical JRPG style, but they definitely 
put a beautiful touch on it. And I think the fans are going to be on YouTube listening to the songs on loop for many years to come. That's always the goal. It's always the goal. Before we go, the last thing I want to ask about this game is since we talked earlier about this being like a Kickstarter goal, like a backer goal, and it was a, a stretch goal for that. Do you see more games like this coming out of this franchise in the future? I know it's still all very new, but do you think that it could have this kind of split where it continues to do two types of games? Anything is possible. It really comes down to the success. If, they're, if Rising is a huge success, if Hunter Heroes is the huge success we think it's going to be, who knows what's possible? You know, it could be this massive franchise, you know, in the future. I mean, it already is shaping up to be that way. I mean, looking at the booth over the last few days, huge fans coming out in support, which we love. And we just want to see more of it. And I feel that the future is very bright. And with that bright future, anything's on the table. Absolutely. We've got two new fans right now. So, yeah, no, we really enjoyed it. Thank you for taking the time. So tell folks again the game where they can find it and where they can probably find updates about the game up until its release. Sure. So Uden Chronicle Rising, which is coming out May 10th, Uden Chronicle Hunter Heroes is the core game that was backed on Kickstarter, which was the number one backed Kickstarter game of 2020. Best way to connect with the community is on Discord, discord.gg slash euden. We have daily events. We have giveaways. Even at PAX right now, we're giving away full sets of pins. You can't buy anywhere else. We only made 100 each. And there are awesome collector's items. So stop by the booth or stop by the community on Discord. We're on every major social platform as well. Well, thank you for taking the time to chat with us. Steve, the last thing I'll ask is we have a saying on the podcast, which is happy gaming. Well, this is Steve and Mr. Game Theory Tukowski and happy gaming. <laughs>